Today, experts have described approximately 20 coral diseases, but only the causes for five of these have been identified. To get a better understanding of coral disease behavior, scientists from the University of Florida are looking at a sea anemone for help. Aptasia is a little weedy polyp. It's a distant relative of corals. It's a good laboratory model because it multiplies really fast. It's sturdy, it's easy to work with, unlike corals which are protected and are really difficult to harvest in the wild. We can set up a lot of really interesting experiments with Aptasia in a laboratory. You can simply take the coral pathogen that you've cultured in the lab and infect the animal with a predetermined dose of that pathogen. And then over time, you can monitor disease progression. Which takes about a week. At the end of the experiment, uh, macerate the polyp, break it up and we can plate it on this, and determine whether or not the cause of the sickness was actually from the pathogen that you infected your sea anemone with. Experts hope that by testing a variety of coral microbes on sea anemones, they can better understand which organisms play a role in disease infection. Scientists also conduct DNA experiments with genes from bacteria as a potential way to biologically protect corals from disease. In order to understand how pathogens establish on the surface of a polyp or on the surface of a coral, the first thing we wanted to understand is what are the early events in the interactions. So the first thing that a pathogen comes in contact with is the mucus. To test how effective the mucus is in protecting a coral from harmful bacteria, researchers focus on the genes from pathogens. They try to identify the function of specific genes and how those genes interact with the mucus. Scientists hope to understand the genetic mechanisms that make pathogens stronger or weaker and how those can be manipulated in favor of the coral's health. And the long-term goal of this experiment is to figure out a way to block or inhibit the virulence potential. To do this, scientists isolate and genetically modify specific genes. They're testing how important the newly mutated gene is for virulence or the bacteria's ability to cause disease. These mutations are compared to the genes of the original bacterium or wild type. What I do is test that mutation against the wild type in terms of its ability to grow, growing them together. So once we incubate the plates overnight, the resulting growth looks something like this. And just using sterile toothpicks, we can pick an individual colony from the plate and then simply patch it onto this media containing the antibiotic, canamycin. The antibiotic canamycin is commonly used in molecular biology to treat a variety of bacterial infections. In this case, canamycin represents the native or beneficial bacteria found in the coral's mucus, which fight off disease. So after we incubate these patch plates overnight, then we can look at them. So the ones growing on this plate are our mutant strains. Normally, the antibiotic canamycin would have prevented the bacteria from growing. Instead, the mutated gene allowed the bacterium to colonize the plate. So this mutant is now going to be resistant to the antibiotic canamycin, and those that didn't grow are a wild type. This will tell us how competitively fit the mutant is compared to the wild type. In this case, the mutation caused the bacteria to potentially be more harmful to corals it might come in contact with. In the future, more tests will be performed to identify which mutations can do the reverse and block disease growth. Once we know which behaviors the pathogen relies on for the infection of the coral and the establishment on the mucus, we can then find ways to inhibit these behaviors in the pathogen either by harnessing the potential of native coral-associated bacteria, or maybe by learning something more about coral immunity. If we can prevent the pathogens from establishing on the coral surfaces, that would be the first and the easiest way 
to prevent or stop the disease progression. Experts are still in the early stages of research, but they hope their long-term findings will be a useful tool for future management and protection of coral reefs. In Key Largo, scientists from Florida International University are using underwater cages and garden fertilizer to gain a better understanding of the microbial health of corals. It's kind of like a chessboard when you go out there and dive on the reef. We've got essentially eight different large plots. We have four with nutrients and four with no nutrients. One of the major stressors on reefs is fertilizer that makes its way from land to sea. Dr. Darren Berkeypile and his team study how coral reef communities are affected by nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus. Those are the two big key elements that humans impact the ocean by putting them in a lot, via fertilizer and sewage. So we essentially go by common garden fertilizer that we put in PVC tubes. So we put these enrichment treatments at every corner of those three foot sections and then one in the middle. Within these large plots are also experimental cages that keep herbivorous fish away from select corals. They're essentially made out of plastic coated chicken wire and the mesh is about an inch in size so the small fish can move through but it keeps all the big grazers out. By keeping grazers away and allowing seaweeds to grow at faster rates with the help of fertilizers, scientists are able to mimic stress factors such as pollution and overfishing. Using these experiments, Dr. Berkey Pyle has observed a change in the mustard hill coral, Porites astreides. Seaweed competition causes the Porites astreides to lose an important bacteria. It's gamma proteobacteria. So this one bacteria is always found on Porites astreides. It's thought that it's important for the health and growth of this coral. But when seaweeds start competing against the coral, this bacteria actually disappears from the microbial community. Researchers are still investigating what the effects of this disappearance will have on the coral's health. Scientists from FIU not only monitor shifting microbial groups, but they also examine parrotfish for their potential to spread microbes. So the parrotfish are important herbivores, but some of the parrotfish also eat coral. So we stretch barrier nets out on the bottom of the ocean, herd these parrotfish into the barrier nets with hand nets, catch them, take them up to the boat, and then we swab their mouths with a Q-tip, essentially, put it in a preservative, and then we can extract the DNA off that parrotfish mouth sample, see if we can match the bacteria on the parrotfish mouth to the bacteria on the corals that they just preyed on. They could take a bite of a diseased coral and potentially move a diseased microbe from a diseased coral to a healthy coral. Determining whether or not parrotfish transport microbes from one coral head to another could give experts important insights into how coral diseases spread. Florida scientists aren't just studying the microbial communities of shallow water corals. Dr. Christina Kellogg from the U.S. Geological Survey in St. Petersburg, Florida, examines microbes from deep sea corals. In shallow water corals, if they're unhappy, it's like they change colors, they start to bleach. You can tell the deep sea corals don't bleach, they're already white. To access cold water corals from the depths of the Gulf of Mexico, scientists use manned submersibles. To collect specimens and prevent contamination, Dr. Kellogg created a sampling device which has been dubbed the Kellogg box. It was a big acrylic box that could fit on the front of the submersible and it had 10 separate bins. It's sort of like a little kid, you know, my spaghetti can't touch my sauce. Well, my corals can't touch another coral or sediment or water. By isolating each sample, 
Researchers can maintain the true microbial diversity of each coral and prevent cross-contamination of microbes. Once samples are brought to the lab, Dr. Kellogg can begin the process of DNA extraction. And so when I'm ready to do extractions, I take the tubes out, keep them cold on ice, quickly measure out a very small amount of that powder, which that powder used to be the coral and the mucus and the bacteria. And you keep doing extractions where you make it purer and purer. And in the end, you end up with just pure DNA, and that's what we end up using to put on the microarray phylogyps. Initially developed by the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory to scan airborne microorganisms, scientists like Dr. Kellogg now use the phylo chip to identify the types of bacteria found on coral DNA samples. On those tiny little chips, which are like glass slides, robots spot little dots of DNA, which corresponds to about 50,000 different bacterial types. It allows me to get sort of a top-down view of the community that we haven't had in corals before. If any of the spots that are on the chip match a bacterium that's in my sample, then that spot lights up. The first way people looked at bacteria in general was to culture them. The problem is maybe one to 10% of the bacteria that are in the environment actually will agree to be cultured. And so you only see this tiny little subset of the whole world that's out there. The problem with disease is, what if what's causing the disease doesn't happen to be one of that one to 10% you'd never know. Experts believe it's important to know the microbes that live on corals and how they interact, because they are the earliest warning signs of serious changes on a reef. If something changes in the environment, the water temperature or the level of nutrients, the microbial community will shift. By doing that, they're basically sort of our first diagnostic tool. Before you even see something with your eyes is wrong with the coral, you could see that change if you were looking at the microbiological level. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. And by Divers Direct, inspiring the pursuit of tropical adventure scuba diving.